Would you go to Revelation 14, please? Revelation 14. Nobody comes to Times Square Church without their Bibles. So let me hear the rustling of the leaves, please. Revelation 14. My message this morning, without fault before the throne of God. Without fault before the throne of God. Verse 4, beginning to read verse 5 also. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are, what? Without fault before the throne of God. Now, folks, the first three verses, don't let that bother you about 144,000. That really is, is not a good interpretation. It's multiplications of 12, meaning endless numbers of 12. It's the whole host of God. It has nothing to do with Israel. This has to do with the Israel of Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem, which is us, who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We are the virgins that stand before him without fault. May God encourage you by what you hear this morning. My wife and I were dining with uh, a friend of ours this past week, and she voiced what I believe uh, is the feeling of so many Christians in these perilous times that we face. She said, my husband's an oculist, and he makes and, and uh, places glass eyes. He fits glass eyes. She said, we've worked very hard all our lives, and we've saved some money. And we have a few additional retirement funds, but things are getting very scary, Pastor Dave. We see nations falling into depression all around us. We hear of possible computer disaster coming in the year 2000. We see terrorism on all sides. We hate to listen to the news or pick up a newspaper anymore because every day some new awful thing is happening. And she said, I know Christians are not supposed to be afraid but it's very hard not to. I personally struggle with fear about our mortgage and our car payments because who's want to, who wants to buy glass eyes when the economy goes sour? She said, I have to fight off these human fears daily, and I feel bad about having these fears because I know that as a Christian I should be trusting the Lord and resting in his keeping power. But she said, frankly, in my flesh, it's very scary, and it's hard to fight this inner fear. And I believe she's voicing what is in the hearts of multitudes today who struggle to keep their fear out of their hearts as they hear these terrible reports and the struggle to rest in God's keeping power. And most Christians that I talk to really don't feel prepared physically for an economic collapse or the things that we see happening around the world. And if suddenly things go apart, very few feel prepared for that and and uh, they do see something in the horizon. Intuitively, something is happening to the nation that it's disintegrating, that things are falling apart. And there, there is that human fear. Even the government of the United States is preparing. Last week, uh, Secretary of Defense said there are 120 special trained units now. They're like uh, large SWAT teams that have been prepared to move into 120 of our major cities in case of a breakdown in the year 2000, in case of riots and looting, if the if Wall Street collapses. And uh, on August 20th, just this past week, in all the newspapers, I hope I trust you've seen that the Federal Reserve has announced that it's uh, preparing to put $50 billion more into circulation because they anticipate a run on the banks because of the year 2000, the Y2K problem. And there's a fear that over $150 billion in cash reserves now in the bank. Most of you know local banks have 5% of their money in the bank. They have very little cash. So they're going to put $50 billion more to the $150 billion there because they believe that most Americans, 70 million households, will withdraw an average of $450 to pay for necessities such as food and gas should there be a crisis or a collapse. Now, folks, these are in our newspapers. This is something you read every day. 
Now, no matter how righteous you may be here this morning, no matter how much you pray, how deeply uh, instilled the Word of God is in your heart, humanly these things do affect us. They affect me. I write about it. I prophesy about it. But it is in a personal level. People say, well, Brother Wilson, aren't you concerned? Yes. But folks, I've learned a few secrets that have, have absolutely helped me uh, to focus on, not on the problems that are coming, not on the hard times that are coming, but he's put something in me, and he's, he, I, I, I'm a student of the, of the uh, Puritans, especially John Owens, and, and, and uh, I got this secret from them, because I've got, ex, I have ex, uh, extremely good news for you this morning. I've got incredible news for you. And if you keep your eyes on this news I'm about to give you, and focus on it every day when you get up. None of these other evil reports or these news reports from around the world are going to phase you at all. Are you ready for the good news? We're all going to die. Better yet, we're all going to the judgment. Good news. So you're losing it, Pastor. No, not at all. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. One minute in eternity, you'll know how insignificant all of these things are, that they never really did matter, that he was there all the time in his keeping, saving power, and it didn't make any difference whatsoever. One second into eternity. I can imagine someone thinking this morning, Pastor, how can this be good news? I'm trying to just rid my heart of the fears about the coming depression and you and the rioting and looting you say is going to come to this city. And now you tell me I'm going to stand before God and give an account of every thought and every deed because he said every thought's going to be brought into captivity. Every evil deed that I've, I've ever committed in my life, I've got to give an account of all the good and bad in my life. That's a fearful thing. What are you talking about good news? Folks, if you understand your Bible, if you understand the Word of God, you're rooted and grounded in this book, you're going to find that if you keep your mind focused on the New Jerusalem state of mind, if you keep your mind focused on the day you stand before Almighty God, and it's a time of joy and thanksgiving, and that's what I'm going to prove to you this morning, that it's your coronation day. It's a time preceding the marriage supper of the Lamb where God, or rather Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, is going to embrace you. Hallelujah. Wonderful news. That if you're trusting in Jesus, you are under his cleansing blood. If you've been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You are going to stand before the throne of God without fault. You're going to stand before him without fear. And you are going to be acknowledged before every sinner, before the devil, and every demon in hell as the bride of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you that you will not face a single sin that's been against you. You will not be exposed for any failure. You will be there without spot or blemish. In fact, on that day, all your bad works will have been done away with. Only your good works are going to be expressed or exposed to the multitudes of the nations that are gathered. Now, I'm not going to get into discussion this morning about the judgment seat of Christ or whether there's one general resurrection and one general great white throne judgment. The Puritans and many, many theologians down through history believe in one general resurrection. Others believe that there are two, that the Christian goes to the judgment seat of Christ First, let me tell you this, that on that great white throne judgment, the Bible says we are all going to be there. And and, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you before I'm finished where I stand on that, because I, I, I'm going to prove to you, I believe from the scripture, that if there is a judgment of Christians separate, it's going to be a one by one, one at a time Judgment, not before the crowds, and if there are works to burn, it'll be between you and Jesus and nobody else. I can prove that powerfully here, and, 
then I believe there's one great white throne judgment where all stand together. You say, but doesn't the Bible say God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil? You say, how can it be then that the saints are going to stand before God without fear if all of the bad works are going to be brought into the light? Now, keep in mind that the great white throne judgment, there are two classes of people. There are sheep and there are goats. There are the faithful and unfaithful. There are the saints and the sinners, the sons and the slaves. The Bible says there's going to be wise and foolish, believers and unbelievers. And at the great white throne judgment, every sinner is going to face his book. Every sinner is going to face every evil thought that he's ever thought. Millions upon millions of evil thoughts. Every sinful deed, every rejection of every scripture, every sermon he's ever heard, every sinner will stand before God and give an account of everything that is bad, everything that is evil. But listen to me, saints. When you stand before him, you stand complete in Jesus Christ. You stand complete in nothing you've ever said, anything you have done that is under the blood of Jesus Christ will never again be mentioned, never brought before the clouds of darkness. This same judgment Christ will make known to the devil, to the demons of hell, to the fallen angels, and all the wicked of all ages. He will bring to the open every known, every prayer that every Christian has ever pray, prayed, every heart cry of the righteous. He will remember every tear, every fast, every groan of the Spirit, every trial, every suffering, every word of praise and thanksgiving. He will remember even the cup of cold water that you gave to the thirsty, every morsel of bread to the hungry, every piece of clothing to the cold and the naked. He's going to bring it all out in the open. You say, how would there ever be time? Well, time shall be no more. Folks, he could do this in, 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 uh, in, in a situation where we are not even aware of time. In, in our time element, it could last for ages and yet go just like that because we're in eternity. We don't understand that. But he's going to, he's going to bring before the devil and throw right in his face. Every worship, every praise, every groan of the Spirit, every time I've been alone with Jesus and poured my heart out, it's going to be rehearsed before the devil and all the crowds of hell. There's nothing you've done to his glory that will not be expressed on that day. There will be no condemnation for the righteous, none at all. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, that he that heareth my words... And believe on him that sent me have everlasting life shall not come into condemnation. And in the original Greek shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. You shall not come into judgment, but to everlasting life. Glory be to God. God said through Isaiah, I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions. For my own sake. And I will not remember thy sins again. Isaiah 43, 25. Isaiah 44, 22. I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. And as a cloud all thy sins. Return unto me for I have redeemed thee. Paul the apostle. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and their iniquities. Will I remember no more. Hebrews 5, 17. This is the covenant I will make with them after these days. Those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds, I shall write them. And their sin and iniquities will I remember no more. And you know that all-encompassing scripture. In Micah seven nineteen, He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities. This is good news for everybody who's sweating in their own flesh, trying to kick and mortify the deeds of the flesh. How many bullets have you tried to bite? How many promises have you made? How much sweat have you sweated trying to please God and walk in holiness and fight your own lust and your own habits? My Bible says God through the Holy Ghost will subdue them. 
You can't do it in your own strength and your own power. But then he says, if you allow the Holy Ghost to do it, this is the promise. And thou, thou, God will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Not only does he cast, you want to tell, you want to know how he does it? He takes your sins and flips them over your shoulders. This is what it says. Thou hast in love to my soul delivered me from the pit of corruption, for thou hast thrown all my sins behind thy back. Isaiah 38, 17. All through the scripture, God said, when I forgive you, I forget every sin, every transgression, all iniquities I have forgotten. Why can't you and I? Why do we allow the devil to dig up something in the uh, muck and mire of our past that's already under the blood? Oh, folks, one of the biggest sins on the face of the earth is to doubt the cleansing, forgiving power of the blood of Jesus Christ. What an awful sin it is. The Bible says on that day, the books are going to be open. Would you go to Revelation 20, please? It's going to read. Let's, let's start with verse uh, 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Thank God he has everything under control. The devil's time is limited. Where the beast and the false prophets are. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was no place for them. No, found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open. And another book was open. Now notice, there are books. Every sinner has his own book. It, I, can you imagine the sinner standing before the judgment to answer for every deed, every thought, everything? If you're here this morning and you are rejecting Jesus Christ outright, you rejected his offer of love, you've heard his appeal, you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit, and yet you go your own selfish, stubborn way. Oh, the day comes when you stand before his throne and you answer that book will be opened and every deed and every thought will be opened and exposed. And it be something incredible, incredibly frightening to hear Hitler's book opened in the name of every Jew that he murdered. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when the transgressors stand before him? All the mass murderers and all the politicians and all the lies that they've covered everything that they've done and it's all brought out into the open, everything, until they're screaming, no, 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 enough, enough, and it, it's only the beginning and everything is brought into the light. All those numbered among the transgressors. What a time. All of the... The kings of Israel and kings of Judah from the, all the way back. The murders and the rapists and the books are opened. And sinner, your book will be opened. And the Bible says, and the books were opened. But you see, there's a, a, in comparison to all these books. Now, I don't know if these are literal. We're not talking about literal books. God, God, Listen, I'll tell you what, if, if they can put a whole library on a little floppy disk, can you imagine what God's mind can do when you talk about books being opened? But there's one book for all saints, all believers, one book. And there's nothing in it but your name. And it's a new name that only God knows and he's going to reveal it to you at that time. It's going to have something to do with your nature here on earth, I believe. I hope mine has something to do with overcomer. One book will be opened. 
Folks, there will be no sin, no evil thought, nothing you have ever done because it is under the blood of Jesus and the simplest, most uneducated Christian. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to walk with God for 50 years. It is right now just believing with all of your heart and mind that Christ shed his blood. You claim the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ. You submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You set your mind to seek him with all your heart, your mind, soul, and spirit. And folks, your name is written in the book of life. The books were open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. According to their works, the scripture says, glory be to God. Now, you that are here this morning listening to me who were guilty of scarlet sins. Now, there are scarlet sins. I mean, they are blood red with this, with the stench of hell, drugs, alcohol, homosexuality, prostitution, you name it. There are some of you that sit here this morning you don't even want to think about your past. And folks, you don't have to think about your past, but you are told to remember the pit from which you were dug. And there are some of you sitting here right now, you blush to think of what you were, how close you came to falling into hell. And you really should be dead. I mean, physically, you should be in hell right now. Stop and think about that. You could be in hell now but for the work of the Holy Spirit in this good book. But I want to tell you something. I've got a scripture for you that can take you to the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. It can take you to the right way throne judgment with exceeding great joy. Hallelujah, because when you're under the blood, you don't, he does not look at you anymore as a piece of filth. He doesn't look at you as a junkie or a prostitute. He looks at you as a spotless, precious bride. Isaiah one eighteen, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, white as snowy wool. Are you under the blood? You had the sprinkling of blood on your heart. You sit here now with every right to say, I am clean. All my sins were crimson red, but they're as white as wool. My name is in the book of life. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let's talk about that moment you stand before the great white throne judgment. How can the bridegroom charge his own bride on that day with iniquity? How, how, how does the husband-to-be look at the wife-to-be and charge him in front of all the wicked? Impossible. He's your judge. Yes, he's your judge to the wicked. But the Christ who called you, the Christ who saved you, the Christ who interceded for you all these years, who cleansed you, who purchased you with his own blood, who branded you on the forehead as his own beloved, he, your Christ, will be at the judgment, your husband, your redeemer, your friend, your advocate, your intercessor still. He will be all of that. You will be complete in him without spot or wrinkle or without fault before his throne. How do you sit there without saying at least a big amen? I mean, incredible. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And if you're faultless, how does he condemn you? Faultless. I want to get out of your mind once and for all that the great white throne judgment for Christian is a fearful thing. It is a, it is something that should bring the greatest joy possible to your heart. Glory to God. Blotting out 
the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Folks, the Bible said we are the body of Christ and he is the head. You think for one minute he's going to sever his head at the judgment day from his body? In front of the wicked? Bible says he's the cornerstone of the church. Is he going to bring the whole beam building down at the judgment? No way! Now, I want to bring the hammer down, the hammer of God's word, and completely smash once and for all any fear you have as a true believer of standing before the judgment in that great day of accounting so that you can anticipate it from now on with great joy and thanksgiving. I'm going to give you a few irrefutable Bible reasons why you have no reason to fear but every reason to rejoice. Hallelujah. I told you that I see all these things coming in the earth and they're wrong because, folks, the Bible makes it clear that this life is just grass. It's just fading away. It's grass. It's here and gone. The Bible said your life is like, you've been on a frosty day and just the vapor, that heat vapor from your mouth. He said, it's your life. Why worry? You don't have time for it. And you don't belong here anyhow. And live or die, you're the Lord's. Folks, it's, it's, it, we're, it's all pointing to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to a feast. But before that, we're going to the judgment. Hallelujah. All right, reason number one why you need to rejoice. Fear is not compatible with all the wonderful relationships He's proclaimed to us in his relationship to us. In other words, God himself has defined who he is to us. And it's not compatible to fear. Listen to what he said he is to us. He said, I'm your father. I'm your brother. I'm your friend. I'm your bridegroom. I'm your head. I'm your husband. I'm your advocate. I'm your kinsman redeemer. I'm your provider, your refuge, your shepherd. And much, much more. Now, God himself established that relationship. That's how he defines himself in relationship to us. I didn't define it that way. You didn't. God said, this is who I am to you. And he is not going to change at the judgment. He's still your father. He's still your friend, your advocate, your interceder. You think for one moment in front of the devil and all the raging piles of hell, he's going to deny his relationship to you? <laughs> no. Put the hammer to it. Smash it. Another reason. How can you fear on the day of your restitution and coronation? He hath not dealt with us after our sins. He has not rewarded us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Anybody tell me how far the east is from the west? <laughs> he said, that's how far I've removed your sins. He said, why do you call it your coronation day? Because Isaiah said of that day, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so God shall rejoice over thee. And he was speaking of that very day as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. And there you stand before him and he has eyes for you. He is just reaching out to embrace you in front of the whole multitudes of transgressors. That's my bride on the right, the goats on the left, the bride on the right. Hallelujah. When the Bible says the nations of the world be separated sheep and goat, that's peoples, not countries. Can you name me any country on the face of the earth that would fit the description of feeding and clothing and housing and all of these things? There's not a nation in the world. Never will be. He's talking about peoples. How can you fear when the Lord is gazing on you with love and rejoicing? 
Hallelujah. It's still the apple of his eye. Another hammer. The Lord will do less, the Lord will do on that day no less than it requires of us today. He will not require something of us that he would not be willing to do himself on the judgment day. I want you to listen closely. And folks, if, if you've got any remaining fear, let this end it once and for all. <clears throat> the Lord requires of us to hide and cover and forgive the sins of our brothers and sisters. The scripture said, if thy brother offend thee, go and tell him his fault between him and thee alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, if there's going to be a separate judgment for Christians, this is where I get it. The Lord's saying, if you're going to forgive your brother, you're not going to bring it before the whole crowd. And unless there is, it, it, they, they reject your offer, you bring it before the church, yes, but that, there, there's a process there. But first, it's one to one. It's one to one. You go to your brother, listen to it, tell him his fault between him and thee alone. Now, folks, if they're going to be works that burn, it's going to be Jesus in you, Jesus in me, in a private conversation with his bride. When he says lovingly, I cannot bring this baggage with you. I can't bring I want to show you what you missed and how it could have been. There's glory, nothing but glory. You're my precious bride. You're under the blood. There's no spot. There's no wrinkle. But let me remind you. Let me speak to you. It'll be one on one. It's not for restitution. No, it's to show the glory of Christ himself and his forgiving power so that the bride will understand the glory of this love. God is offended when Christians point out the weaknesses and infirmities of other saints. The Lord will deal with that. He will do no less for us when we stand before him. The Bible said the discretion of a man defers his anger. It's a glory of a, for a man to pass over transgressions. Proverbs 25, 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. The glory of God to conceal that which is under the blood. Hallelujah. Christ is hidden. He's covered. He's pardoned. He's absolutely wiped away the sins by his own blood. All his transgressions that he hath committed, thou shalt, they shall not be mentioned unto him. Ezekiel 18, 22. They shall not be mentioned unto him. They're blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm bringing you this message this morning that it be an anchor to you in the days, the dark days ahead. There are many, many dark days coming, incredibly confusing days. But all, oh, I remember what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther, this was shortly after he was ejected from his ministry. He was penniless. He had no, nothing to look forward to in the future. He was castigated. He was considered a heretic by multitudes. Martin Luther made a statement at the height of that. He said, Dear Lord, now that you've forgiven all my sins, you can do with me as you please. And what he's saying, this is the most important thing. I know that if a God, if I have a God who can forgive and cleanse me of all my sins and bring peace to my soul, why should I fear what man can do to me? Why should I fear if everything collapses around me because I serve a God who is able to forgive and give me eternal salvation. Why would I not believe him to keep me while I live here on this earth? Can you say that this morning? Lord, now that I'm forgiven, now that I'm pardoned, now that I'm able to stand before you on the judgment with exceeding great joy, do with me as you please. Hallelujah. I want to give you something further, but I want you to stand before I do, if you will, please. Now, I know there's been a short message, but I'm, 
I'm not in the habit of dragging anything out just to put in time. This gives us more time to praise the Lord. Now, I want you to listen. I, I got to read it because I wrote it down and the Lord just blessing me. If, if, would you say that? If, yeah. I'm going to tell you this. If God can seal us eternally by the blood of his own son, if he can translate these bodies and change them into new bodies like his own, if he can melt the very elements with fire and create a new heaven, a new earth, if he can send angels on that day to claim us when Christ appears again, if he can come again with tens of thousands of chariots to display his glory, if he can present me to his son on judgment day with exceeding great joy, if he can build me a golden house in glory, if he can pave his streets with gold, if he can give me eternal life and everlasting celestial food to feed me all through eternity, if he can even now feed a world full of fowls of the air, it doesn't say fowls of the earth, the chickens that we feed, the fowls of the air that God feeds. He can even now feed every animal, the millions and millions of animals in the oceans. If he can do all of this, will he not take care of you, all ye of little faith? Will he not care for his own? Now, while you're up, Get your Bibles and go to Matthew 6, and this is where I'll close. Matthew 6. You can read better standing anyhow. All right, here we go. Chapter 6, verse 25, beginning to read right to the end of the chapter. Ye shall know the truth, so it'll set you free. Hallelujah. God bless this to our hearts. Help us never to forget it in troubled times. Therefore I send you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. How much thought should you give? No thought. Nor yet for your body, which ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto his stature? Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I send to you that even Solomon, all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. For all these things do the Gentiles seek. He said, that's, that's Gentile faith. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom. Read it with me, folks. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Hallelujah to God forevermore. Now, lift your hands and just tell Jesus you trust him right now. Lord, I trust you. I believe you. I rest in your promises. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You will go with us to the very end. Glory be to the name of our Lord. Glory be to God forever. Yesterday, today, and forever the same. Never changes. You will keep us by your grace. Hallelujah. We bless your holy name. We glorify you by your word. Thank you for your word, Lord, that holds us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we truly worship you. Some of you are uncomfortable in this message this morning. 
because of a sin problem. Sin. And when there's sin that's not forsaken, robs you of peace, brings guilt, fear, and condemnation in the presence of the pure word of God. And in, in, in all of the auditoriums in the annexes, and here in the main auditorium, and downstairs in the lower rotunda, wherever you may be watching on screen, let me tell you the Holy Spirit's here. When his word is brought forth, as he declares it, as anointed of his spirit, <clears throat> he doesn't intend for it to just drop at this stage, right in front of me. He intends it to accomplish its work. And some of you were sent here by the Holy Spirit. You're not here by accident. You're here today, right now. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about a sin. Sin. The Bible said we're to confess and forsake our sins. You say, well, Brother Wilson, there's a problem in my life that I've confessed over and over again, but I have not been able to forsake it. Now, I'm telling you there's power to enable you to not only confess but forsake your sins. And you have to want that. If you're flirting with your sin, you're comfortable with it, and you've, you've grown hardened in it already, God help you. It's going to take an absolute miracle of God. If I were in that position, I would run out of my seat. I'd say, God, I'm on the, I'm on the brink of getting hard in this thing and I'm not be able to be convicted again. God help me. God help you if you toyed and played with it so long and you've, sh you've shunted off so much conviction of the Holy Spirit and you've heard message after message. I would get out of my seat quickly. I would come down here and make it right with God. Those of you that are hearing me now, say, Pastor Dave, I've got a sin problem. I want to stand before the throne of God with exceeding great joy, but right now, I am not ready to stand before him and enjoy what you're talking about this morning. No one's going to put a microphone on your face and ask you any silly questions or embarrass you. But it's life and death with some of you. Up on the balcony, go to the stairs on either side. Here in the main auditorium, step out. And in the annex, if you will go to the lobbies, the ushers will show you how to get into this building. You come down the stairs and meet me right here. And I'm going to pray with you and I'm going to believe that Jesus sends you out of this place free. Cleansed, absolutely clean. Oh, there should be something in your heart says, Pastor, Dan, I want to be clean. I want to look God in the eye. I want to be able to stand before the judgment and look Jesus right in the eye and say, Thank you for your blood. You've not only cleansed me, but you've empowered me by your spirit to live a victorious life. Get out of your seat and come and join these that are coming. Wherever you're at, all over. You hear me downstairs, you come upstairs. Upstairs, you come downstairs. Come into the main auditorium while we're singing. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Come and join thee. Move in tight, please, for those that will be coming. Again, while they're coming from the annex and the other building, or the other uh, auditoriums, Lord bless you, we'll wait for you. God is in no hurry, and we're in no hurry. Look, don't be afraid to cry. That's all right. Don't be afraid to cry. Let it out. Let it out. That's all right. God said he wants, he, he, he will not reject a broken, contrite heart and spirit. Now tell him why you came forward. Talk to him, right? Now, I want everybody came forward to tell Jesus why you came. Ask him to cleanse you and forgive you right now. And say, Jesus, I come to the blood, the sprinkling of the blood. Everybody, speak right out to him right now. Nobody will hear you. Nobody's going to think anything about it. Lord, I have a sin problem. I need to be pardoned. I need to be cleansed. Jesus, I come to hide nothing. I come to open my heart to you. I hold nothing back. Nothing back. I hold nothing back from you, Jesus. I bring it into the light by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, dig everything out that's hidden in my life. Bring it to the surface. Expose it, Lord, to my heart that I may deal with it through your Spirit. Now I want you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I acknowledge, I admit, I have a sin problem. And I want to be free. I confess it to you, Lord Jesus. I can't get victory 
in my own power strength. But you have promised me the Holy Spirit to come into me and abide with me and give me authority and power over sin, flesh, and the devil. I believe that. And by faith, I submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ now and here. In Jesus' name. Now, I want you to just thank him for his faithfulness to you right now. I want you to thank him. Jesus, I give you thanks. I give you thanks. I give you praise. Hallelujah. God, I thank you. I give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.